On November 9th, 1975, a large ship set sail on a routine voyage across Lake Superior. The following day, that mighty Fitz encountered a powerful storm and vanished without a trace. 29 brave men lost their lives that very day. One year later, Canada's preeminent troubadour immortalized this solemn story in one of the rock era's most haunting and spine-tingling ballads ever. Today, we're gonna dive deep into that nautical tale and pay our respects to the men who lost their lives, as well as celebrate the songwriter who honored them. Coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you judge people by the contents of their vinyl collection, you're gonna dig this channel. That's what I do. Make sure that you subscribe below right now so that you never miss out on our exclusive interviews and the stories behind the songs. Click the bell so you don't miss out. We also have a Patreon, and there you'll find uh, additional footage, exclusive content. You can even become an honorary producer. Patreon really helps us to keep this a daily channel. Check that out below. Of the hundreds of songs that Canada's national treasure, Gordon Lightfoot, has written through the decades, he is perhaps most proud of the classic work, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. The legend lives on from the Chippewa down. It's easy to understand why. The song tells in dramatic fashion the true story of the bulk freighter, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald, which uh, sank on Lake Superior on November 10, 1975. The wreck claimed the lives of all 29 crew members and has been a source of speculation and mystery throughout the years. The idea for the song began while Gordon Lightfoot was busy working on his album, Summertime Dream. One night, he happened to catch a report on the 11 o'clock news about the sinking of the Fitzgerald in a fierce storm. Lightfoot remembered the night very well. The wind was even howling where he was in Toronto, um, wondering what it must have been like on Lake Superior. It wasn't long before he had a melody, which was something like the drone of an old Irish chanty. Now later, as Gordon Lightfoot contemplated crafting the lyrics, he discovered a Newsweek article called The Cruelest Month. Upon reading the opening line, he was quickly captivated. According to the legend of the Chippewa tribe, the lake they once called Gitchagumi never gives up her dead. Lightfoot, who had been fascinated by ships his entire life and was also a sailor himself, he immersed himself in research to learn all that he could about the Fitzgerald's fate. There was just something uh, truly mystical about a ship sinking that touched him very deeply. Lightfoot's musical memorial is truly one of the most haunting songs of the entire 1970s. To honor both Gordon Lightfoot and the crew of the Edmund Fitzgerald, let's go ahead and take a closer look at the lyrics of this incredible song and the story behind them. Now, the first verse opens up with the aforementioned Chippewa legend about Lake Superior, which they call Gitchigumi. Uh, never giving up or dead. Gordon Lightfoot then paints a brief picture of the Edmund Fitzgerald, noting that it was carrying a load of iron ore weighing 26,000 tons. With the load of iron ore, 26,000 tons more. This load was actually taconite pellets, which are chunks of iron mixed with other ores. Uh, though the load was technically over the ship's official limit, this wasn't the first time that the Mighty Fitz had exceeded its capacity. The $7 million vessel was one of the largest ships on the Great Lakes, and it had proven itself capable of weathering even the worst of storms before that. As the big freighters go, it goes bigger than most. Now, the Fitzgerald departed at 2.20 uh, p.m. on November 9, 1975, without any concern. It was a sunny Sunday afternoon, Within 20 minutes, the National Weather Service issued a gale warning for the region. Uh, the storm was predicted to stay mostly landlocked and pass to the south of the Fitzgerald's route. Lightfoot took some poetic license with a few of the details in the song. For instance, as the second verse opens up, 
Gordon Lightfoot says that the Fitzgerald departed from some mill in Wisconsin. Now, in actuality, the Fitz departed from a Burlington Northern Railroad ore dock. And though the Fitzgerald's final destination was in Cleveland to hold up for the winter, it was first sailing Zug Island on the Detroit River. Little details like this, you know, relatively minor discrepancies, uh, can easily be chalked up to semantics. A couple of steel firms when they left fully loaded for Cleveland. Now, as is evident throughout the song, though, Gordon Lightfoot really worked hard to make sure that his research was very accurate. When Gordon sings that the ship had a crew and a good captain well seasoned, he was spot on. The 63-year-old captain, Ernest M. McSorley, was a 44-year veteran of the lakes. He had been with the Mighty Fitz since 1972 and had captained nine other ships before that one. McSorley had been given the go-ahead to select his crew, and he had complete confidence in all of them. As we continue to break down the, uh, the magical history of this haunting 70s classic, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. When you get your eyewear from Zenny Optical, you can say goodbye to foggy lenses and glare with the Zenny's advanced 2-in-1 anti-fog and anti-reflective coating. Really, this is a must-have through the cold months for sure. It's been a game changer for me. Check it out at zenny.com today. So by 7 o'clock p.m., the National Weather Service altered its forecast. This time it issued gale warnings for the entirety of Lake Superior. At this point, it's important to note that the Edmund Fitzgerald wasn't the only ship on the lake that day. Another ship that uh, figured prominently into the narrative was the SS Arthur M. Anderson, uh, captained by Jesse Bernard uh, Bernie Cooper. Both McSorley and Cooper would keep in touch via radio over the course of their voyage across the lake. Now, as the evening passed into the dead of night, Winds were blowing in excess of 50 miles an hour, and 10-foot waves crashed onto the ship. For the next 12 hours, the Fitzgerald kept the Anderson in sight as the weather continued to worsen. But by early afternoon on November 10th, McSorley pulled ahead of the Anderson, perhaps in an effort to outrun the storm. As the weather continued to intensify, though, snow began to pelt the ship, and it became harder and harder for the men on board to see where they were going. It was around this time that uh, Anderson caught its last glimpse of the Fitzgerald. At about 3.30 p.m., McSorley radioed Captain Cooper to tell him that the Fitz was taken on water. Said McSorley, I have sustained some topside damage. I have a fence rail laid down. Uh, two vents lost or damaged. I'm checking down. But even with that damage, you know, with the damage to the ship, the seasoned skipper felt like there was no immediate danger. Amazingly, he seemed confident that the ship would pull through without any problems. The weather conditions, they just continued to worsen as the afternoon turned to evening. By 7 p.m., the storm had almost reached hurricane force with winds close to 70 miles an hour. In the face of a hurricane, west wind. It's estimated that the worst winds and the highest waves, which were now up to 40 feet tall, were centered precisely where the Edmund Fitzgerald was fighting for her life. And this is where tragedy enters into this tale. In an effort to memorialize the moment, Gordon Lightfoot penned the lines, When supper time came, the old cook came on deck saying, Fellas, it's too rough to feed you. The old cook came on deck saying, Fellas, it's too rough to feed you. At 7 p.m., a main hatchway caved in. He said, Fellas, it's been good to know you. hatchway caved in. He said, Fellas, it's been good to know you. Very dramatic part, but uh, this part of the song would actually become a source of controversy and heartache for some of the surviving family members of the Fitzgerald crew later on. Now, there has, of course, been no surefire proof on what caused the Fitzgerald to go under that night. Only speculation, educated guesses. But the idea inadvertently uh, suggested in Lightfoot's lyrics that some of the crew members may have been derelict in their duty to secure the main hatchway proved to be a source of inconsolable grief for some. 
One mother even worried for years that it was her son's fault that the Fitzgerald went down. However, in 2010, new scientific findings debunked the theory that the ship sunk due to crew error. Lightfoot himself found this out uh, when he was contacted for permission to use a song on a TV show about that time. Lightfoot said, I think I found out what actually happened to the Edmonds Fitzgerald. I issued a license for a National Geographic show called Underwater Detectives. He said the, the guy brought it over to the office and he played it for me on this laptop. It broke in half. There's no hatch cover trouble involved. So a couple of guys are off the hook there. Nobody's ever come up with an actual reason why it sank, but when you see this show, you'll understand why it broke in half. Now to reflect these new findings, Gordon Lightfoot from then on changed the line, the lyrics during his live performances. He then sang instead, at 7 p.m. it grew dark. It was then he said, fellas, it's been good to know you. 7 p.m. it grew dark. This simple alteration has brought a greater measure of peace to the families of the crew members. The captain wired in that he had water coming in and the good ship and crew was in peril. And later that night, when his lights went out of sight, came the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. At 7.10, Nick Sorley uh, stated in his last radio transmission before the ship sank that he and his crew were holding our own. Said Captain Cooper, he showed no signs of panic. He was calm. I firmly believe that he thought that the ship was going to get through it. I think it was sudden and catastrophic. The ship just disappeared. Indeed, the Fitzgerald disappeared without a trace. When Cooper looked at his radar, he could no longer see the Fitzgerald. He repeatedly tried to contact the ship uh, via radio, but there was no response. The Fitzgerald was lost in the blink of an eye, really. There was no distress signal sent uh, and no sign of how or why the ship disappeared. And perhaps the most heart-rending and thought-provoking uh, couplet of the song Gordon Lightfoot sings, does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours? These lines, both contemplative and philosophical, they can be interpreted in multiple ways. From the perspective of the crew, uh, the lyrics shed light onto how they may have been feeling in their final moments. Did minutes turn to hours because their lives were flashing before their eyes? Did they feel alone? Did they feel forsaken? It's just always made me contemplate and wonder how I would react in that moment. I'm sure you feel the same. If you only had moments to live, what thoughts would go through your heart and your mind if death was upon you and there's really no going back? Does anyone know? A second interpretation could come from the thoughts of family members and friends as they waited anxiously for news on what happened. Hoping, hoping beyond hope that there were survivors. In this trial of excruciating patience, surely minutes would have seemed to stretch into hours. Then Gordon Lightfoot tells of the speculation that came after the speculation that drives us all mad, you know, when trying to make sense of any devastating tragedy in our lives. When he says, the searchers all say they'd have made Whitefish Bay if they'd put 15 more miles behind her. They might have split up or they might have capsized. They may have broke deep and took water. They might have capsized, they may have broke deep and took water. We always ask those what if questions. And then Gordon Lightfoot describes the legacy in his thoughtful poetry. And all that remains is the faces and the names of the wives and the sons and the daughters. What actually happened may never be fully clear, but that hasn't slowed the speculation. Some experts believe the ship was likely riding two waves at once and that the unsupported weight of its you know, 26,000 ton cargo cracked the ship in half which may have driven the ship to the bottom of the lake in just a matter of seconds. Captain Cooper held a different opinion though. With years of experience on the lakes, he believed that the Fitzgerald plunged headlong into a giant wave. Uh, more than likely, McSorley and his crew would have assumed that they'd come right back up like they had 
countless times before. They may have never even realized that they were going under and then they were just gone. By 7.25 p.m., the crew of the Anderson radioed the Coast Guard to inform them that the Fitzgerald had gone missing. But apparently the Coast Guard was overwhelmed by the storm and you know, they were unable to send any help. At the Coast Guard's request, uh, the Anderson returned to the place where she had last seen the Fitz and uh, you know, began to search for survivors. It, it was to no avail. Over the next three days, ships and aircraft searched the area and patrolled the beaches looking for any survivors, for wreckage. All that they found were paddles, lifeboats, and rafts. There were no survivors or bodies. But the iron boats go as the mariners After the beautiful verse pays homage to the other Great Lakes, iron boats, and mariners, Gordon Lightfoot closes this tragic tale with one final verse where he poignantly sings, In a musty old hall in Detroit they prayed in the Maritime Sailors' Cathedral. Detroit they prayed in the Maritime Sailors' Cathedral. The church bell chimed till it rang 29 times for each man on the Edmund Fitzgerald. 29 times for each man on the Edmund Fitzgerald. The records show that the day after the tragedy, November 11, 1975, in the old Mariner's Church of Detroit, a minister held a memorial service for the lost seamen. Uh, prayers were offered, and the church bell did ring out 29 times in a grim tribute to their memory. Gordon Lightfoot then closes out his sad tell tribute by coming full circle, where once again he sings, the legend lives on from the Chippewa down of the big lake they call Gitchigumi. From the Chippewa down of the big lake they call Gitchigumi. Superior, they said, never gives up her dead when the gales of November come early. When all is said and done, this six and a half minute eerie folk odyssey leaves you feeling just a mixture of complete awe and absolutely paralyzing melancholy. Life what brings the story to life in a way that makes you feel like you are sailing through the very same storm and afterwards mourning with the families of the lost crew. It's a song that continues to haunt your soul long after the music is faded away. And speaking of the music, oh my gosh, the ghastly lead guitar line that combines with the rustling percussion, it gives you the feeling of going back and forth in the ships as the waves grow larger and more severe. The jangly folk guitar barely keeps you steady as Gordon Lightfoot finds a way to effortlessly tell the story without provocation. No word is forced, even though there's a lot to tell. It is a flawless sonic experience that when heard with the right pair of headphones in the dead of night, makes you feel like your heart will just leap out of your chest. And even if you've heard this song a hundred times or more, you have no idea what's going to happen next. You're just feeling every line. Six weeks after its release, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald became a smash hit. The song had clearly struck a nerve with a wide range of listeners, including families of the Fitzgerald's victims. Wives and children of the crew they wrote touching letters to Gordon Lightfoot after the song's release, and he, he made a point of replying to each and every one. Now, by November, almost a year to the day when Lightfoot first heard about the ship going down, the wreck reached number one on Canada's RPM charts, and it reached number one and number two on the U.S. cash box and billboard charts. Should have been a number one hit, no question. Not many songs go to the top of the charts about shipwrecks, let's be honest. Oh, Michigan steams like a young man's dreams. But Gordon Lightfoot, he's such a master storyteller. It changed anyone who would listen for more than five seconds. The wreck of the Edmunds Fitzgerald has been featured in several films and TV shows over the years. A Mystery Science Theater in 92 and 98. Uh, Mike and Mike in 2015 and 2016. Family Guy in 2020 and The Addams Family 2 in 2021. It was also covered by the Dandy Warhols in 98. Uh, As a child, um, this song just tattooed its devastating tale of loss 
on my soul from the very first listen. My parents loved Gordon Lightfoot, and I could sing along to all of his great hits from you know, Carefree Highway. Carefree Highway. The sundown. sundown you better take care. But when this song comes on, or when it came on, all I could do was listen. I never sung along to it. Um, I still don't. It deserves a thought-provoking and thorough listen every time. It's not a song for the faint of heart. There should be more songs like this that honor brave men or women in peril that aren't written to evoke a, a forced emotion or to capitalize on a tragedy. Just a song written by a master storyteller with a heart that is so true that honors a solemn event and the lives of those who experienced it. When it's done in this honest and real way, it somehow brings us as listeners into the tribulation and we are able to honor it with a, a shared perspective of empathy and mourning. It's very rare, but not rare for Gordon Lightfoot. His voice is so distinct, drenched with character and integrity that makes our hearts long for such compelling originality and, and passion. With the gales of November, remember. That's what made the era that Gordon Lightfoot came from so great. You had singer-songwriters from all over the world with so much to say. Their voices were so diverse and varied. From Gordon Lightfoot to James Taylor to Stevie Wonder, Joni Mitchell, Crosby, Stills and Nash, Jim Croce, Sills and Croft, Don McLean, Linda Ronstadt, from Paul Simon to Cat Stevens to Elton John to Billy Joel, Carly Simon, Jackson Brown, Carol King. I could go on and on and on and on. All completely different songs with a sound all their own. What a rich time in history, indeed. Please stay around for a few seconds after we close. I do want to honor the 29 members of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Make sure to leave us a comment about Canada's preeminent songwriter, the legendary Gordon Lightfoot and his solemn tale of the Edmund Fitzgerald. What do you remember about this song? Let us know in the comments. Let's have a good discussion. If you enjoyed this video, we, we do invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.